Hi, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, David Villar. Uh, I'm not a parasitologist by training. I teach uh, pharmacology and toxicology at the University of Antioquia in Colombia. And I was uh, drawn to this uh, topic of uh, parasitology from uh, farmers uh, calling in and complaining that uh, drugs against uh, common parasites that we have in the tropics uh, are no longer working. And a good example is the common uh, cattle tick uh, that you can see in the background on this uh, picture. Uh, that tick uh, had laid a pretty healthy uh, clutch of eggs. And as you can see, all those uh, larvae are starting to uh, crawl all over the place. And I wanted to uh, start by uh, saying that uh, we're now facing a new paradigm in the ways that we can control parasites and any other uh, pests. Uh, and the problem partly lies that uh, over the past uh, half century we have uh, developed production systems that are entirely dependent on the use of agrochemicals and uh, we took for granted that uh, parasites uh, would not be fighting back. And as I will show on the next uh, couple of videos, uh, many parasites have become resistant uh, to all these uh, agrochemicals so we're now confronted with a new challenge uh, which has uh, no single solution and it kind of requires a combination of different practices that we'll uh, try to address in a separate video uh, that we'll call uh, integrated uh, management practices. As I say, I'm not a parasitologist uh, and uh, what I would like to uh, cover on this uh, presentation are some basic points on the biology of uh, parasites that we really need to understand if we w want to win the battle uh, against uh, parasites uh, whenever they uh, pose a, a threat. Uh, and I will uh, use some examples from our own, s our own uh, studies uh, to illustrate some of uh, these points I want to make. On this slide uh, we have five points that we'll uh, discuss, starting by mentioning the different types of uh, parasites, uh, why their specificity to the host uh, becomes important, uh, I'll say something about their uh, life cycle uh, that we can use uh, to intervene wherever they uh, happen to be most uh, vulnerable. And uh, I'll also say something about the population distribution of uh, parasites in a production system, uh, whether this is uh, an extensive grazing system or a feedlot or a total uh, confinement operation. And finally, we will uh, talk about something that we tend to disregard completely and that we sh should really pay more attention to to fight infection uh, which is the fantastic uh, defense immune system of the animal. If we start uh, talking about the different types of uh, parasites uh, we could uh, roughly divide them in, in two large groups. Uh, we have uh, internal or endoparasites that live inside another organism and we have external or uh, ectoparasites uh, that uh, live outside an organism. Uh, here we're just going to focus on the ones that we have most uh, experience in our uh, part of the uh, country. Uh, but as you can see on this slide, uh, they could be further divided into uh, helmins, uh, which are multicellular parasites, uh, and these include the roundworms, uh, the tapeworms, uh, and the flukes. And I guess the fancy names for these are uh, nematodes, uh, cestodes, and uh, trematodes. And of all these, probably everybody's uh, favorites are likely the tapeworms, at least in ruminants, because they're probably the biggest ones and uh, easier, easier to spot with the naked eye. And they're, But in reality, these uh, are not very pathogenic. In other words, uh, they cause uh, little consequence to the health of the animal, uh, so we will not really uh, say much about this uh, type of parasites. Uh, the picture on the right uh, shows the mouth of uh, the barber pole worm, uh, which is a nematode that causes uh, severe losses in small ruminants, and as, uh, as we will uh, describe later. And uh, worldwide is uh, definitely the most uh, problematic to raising uh, sheep and goats. Uh, the other group of uh, internal parasites uh, are the protozoans, uh, which are single cell, and some important ones, uh, to name a few, are the coccidia, uh, the Cryptosporidium and the Neospora. And finally, of the external uh, parasites, uh, we will talk uh, about the cattle tick and some of the uh, flies that uh, are of uh, uh, most uh, concern here in the tropics. 
the first point that I, I would like to uh, draw some attention is that uh, parasites tend to be very host specific. Uh, in other words, uh, different species don't share the same parasites and they rarely cross from one species to another. Uh, this will be very important later on when we uh, talk about uh, doing integrated uh, management uh, programs to control parasites. Uh, but uh, one way we could, uh, for example, uh, break the cycle, if you c had the luxury of doing so, uh, would be to rotate in, uh, say, between uh, cattle, uh, sheep and goats. Uh, all these uh, species tend to share uh, different parasites. Now, having said this, I should point out that uh, there are some exceptions uh, to the rule, as always in biology. For example, uh, sheep and goats uh, being different species, they share the same parasites. And if we include uh, llamas and alpacas, uh, uh, these uh, two species can get the same parasites as uh, cattle and, and small ruminant. I guess uh, we could say they kind of fall in between the large and the small ruminants. There are also some parasites uh, that are an exception to the rule in that they can use uh, uh, multiple uh, host species and I'm thinking specifically of, of the tropical warble fly which is one of the most uh, important ectoparasites uh, that we have uh, in cattle in Colombia. Now it's also important to note that uh, there are breeds uh, within each species that are highly resistant uh, to some parasites. Uh, for example the Cebus uh, which are the the cattle that you can see on the lower uh, left image. Uh, this is a tropical uh, cattle breed that is descendant of the Bos indicus and as opposed to the European breeds uh, which come from the Bos taurus, uh, this breed is very highly resistant to the cattle tick. Uh, I'll have to say that I have examined many of these animals uh, throughout the, the course of uh, uh, quite a few years uh, and I rarely find uh, any uh, fully engorged uh, ticks on any of them. Now another good example of a resistant uh, breed uh, in this case uh, for the barber pole worm uh, would be the uh, the hair Caribbean sheep as opposed to the wool sheep and uh, on the lower right picture uh, we have uh, some Katat sheep uh, this is a breed that is very well established uh, here in Colombia and uh, probably together with the St. Croix are probably the most uh, resistant breeds to the barber pole worm. Now another aspect of the biology of parasites that should be contemplated on any control program uh, deals with the basic knowledge of uh, their life cycle uh, of each uh, particular parasite. Uh, there are parasites that have a direct life cycle which simply means they do not need a, an intermediate host and there are those with an indirect life cycle like for example the liver fluke that requires a mud snail uh, to complete its cycle and that obviously becomes a potential uh, target for intervention. As we will see uh, with the specific examples uh, a rough estimate of, of the duration of each uh, life stage in the cycle uh, becomes quite uh, valuable information not only to predict the risk of infection but also to implement uh, strategies to uh, break the cycle. Of all the factors that affect the cycle of parasites uh, probably the most important one by far would be the climate. Uh, parasites uh, need uh, moisture and a proper temperature uh, for their, their uh, development uh, and in countries uh, with a cold winter season uh, they pretty much become inactive during the winter. Uh, in other words, they, they tend to arrest uh, their cycle, they'll stay uh, dormant, if you like, and if, th if this uh, dormant state uh, happens to uh, take place inside the host, it's called a state of hypobiosis. And if you think about it, it makes sense because if the, if the parasites try to uh, uh, complete their cycle, uh, it's very cold outside of the host and they would simply just uh, freeze to death. Now the other condition apart from temperature uh, is humidity. Uh, they usually don't tolerate dryness very well because that will uh, desiccate uh, the eggs and larvae outside of the host. So if we have a dry and hot season uh, it's unlikely that uh, parasites will be a match of an issue but obviously the severity and the risk of infection is also going to depend on other factors. Just keep in mind that weather is always changing and it can really tip the balance uh, one way or the other uh, in favor of the host or the parasite. 
Now I'm going to illustrate uh, five life cycles uh, for common parasites that affect ruminants in Colombia and starting on this diagram we have the typical cycle of a round worm uh, like the barber pole worm uh, that takes between uh, 14 to 21 days uh, to complete its cycle uh, that's under uh, optimal conditions obviously uh, the adults uh, live in the abomasum of sheep uh, they they lay eggs that are passed on to the pasture with uh, fecal pellets and they hatch uh, and go through three larval stages in just a couple of days as you can see uh, on this image then the uh, L3 larvae will crawl onto the leaves of plants and it will just uh, wait for a new host to ingest it uh, to complete its cycle. Now it's important to note that uh, runworm larvae, uh, at least uh, this type of parasites, uh, stay in the first uh, two to three inches at the base of those uh, grass leaves. They really have no uh, legs uh, like ticks or uh, flippers or wings to go any farther up. This, this obviously becomes important because if we, if we overgraze uh, those uh, pastures we tend to increase the exposure of our livestock to more parasites. Uh, this is uh, not very well represented on this uh, diagram here because it looks like those uh, larvae can, can reach uh, higher sections on those uh, uh, leaves. Uh, but it, another thing to keep in mind is uh, the feeding behavior of our animals. Uh, for example, uh, sheep tend to uh, keep their head on the ground when they're grazing. Uh, they do not uh, graze at the top like cattle do. And obviously th that will expose them to uh, those uh, L3 larvae to a greater uh, extent than cattle. On the next uh, videos uh, I will illustrate a case that was uh, presented to us that was causing severe uh, heavy losses in sheep uh, due to the barber pole worm. I it had become totally resistant to every uh, uh, dewormer that we have available in the country and I will come back to the cycle in this diagram just to to show what we proposed the farmer uh, in an attempt to uh, break the cycle now in Colombia uh, and probably most uh, other tropical countries uh, the climate is uh, conducive uh, for year-round uh, parasite problems uh, we don't have uh, such a thing as uh, an overwintering like in uh, temperate areas uh, and this is important because uh, those L3 larvae if they're not ingested by a host uh, in about two months time uh, they will probably starve to death on, on those grasses and obviously this becomes important if we want to uh, decontaminate or uh, clean a pasture from this uh, type of worm. The second cycle that I would like to uh, address uh, pertains to a parasite that constitutes a real problem to raising uh, European cattle breeds in the tropics and I'm referring to the so-called uh, cattle fever tick uh, whose scientific name is uh, Boophilus uh, microplus it has now been uh, changed to uh, Ripicephalus microplus uh, I guess the names don't roll off my tongue easily so I may not be pronouncing those correctly but but uh, if you take a look at this uh, diagram uh, this is a parasite that has a direct life cycle that may take any time or anywhere between two months uh, under optimum conditions all the way up to uh, nine months if those environmental conditions are not uh, favorable uh, this, is, this becomes extremely important because it gives you an idea of how long you may need to uh, rest or, or vacate a, a pasture to clean it from uh, parasites. As an example, I told farmers uh, in pastures like the ones you see here on the right image that if they could uh, vacate that pasture for at least uh, three months uh, without introducing any cattle in that time, and that would probably give enough time to starve those uh, tick larvae that are at the tip of those uh, grass leaves just waiting for a cow to uh, uh, go by and attach on it. As you can see on this diagram, the, left, uh, the life stages on the animal may take uh, between 18 to 35 days. Uh, that's from the time that the thick larvae uh, will attach uh, to the time it's going to fall as an engorged uh, female. That engorged female will then spend about 14 days laying up to a uh, 3,000 uh, eggs and after uh, 27 days uh, from the date those uh, eggs were laid a single larvae arises and it climbs to the tip of those uh, grass leaves and it just uh, waits there for an animal to go by and it, it can stay alive up to uh, um, 
two months, uh, give and take a few weeks, uh, depending on the weather. If, if the weather is cold, what tends to happen is that those, uh, those engorged females will simply uh, hibernate and postpone the deposition of eggs until the temperature rises. Uh, this will obviously extend the life cycle, as I mentioned earlier, but, uh, and that's something that always needs to be uh, kept in mind. Uh, low temperatures simply uh, slow the metabolism of this uh, parasite, but unless we have a real frost uh, that the temperature uh, uh, you know, freezes, uh, it doesn't get to the point of uh, killing uh, ticks. I, o I also mentioned that uh, three months uh, is probably good enough to uh, clean those uh, pastures because uh, we can keep uh, tick larvae alive in the incubator uh, for about two months uh, with ideal conditions of uh, temperature and humidity, uh, which is pretty much uh, what uh, we see on farms like uh, the ones you see here on this picture. And we, re and we would need to add uh, the extra months uh, for the time those uh, eggs are incubating until they hatch. I wanted to show you a short video of a case that was uh, presented to us. This is a three-year-old uh, Simmental bull that was uh, that had uh, repeated infestations uh, with ticks. Uh, you can notice all those uh, uh, engorged uh, ticks on the throughout the body on that animal, and uh, this was definitely a, a case of a, a clear case of human neglect. Uh, that animal could have been uh, confiscated from the owner if 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 we were in a different country. Uh, but what we did uh, on this case was to uh, apply a combination of uh, three different acrocytes that had not been used in this farm. We knew that uh, pyrethroids and uh, ivermectin wouldn't work. Uh, and then we basically outlined a management uh, program for the owner to prevent uh, reinfestation. But if you look at the short video clip below, uh, it would seem like that animal was uh, really living on a paradise for any cow. Uh, in reality, that's the case, but this, unfortunately, this uh, type of uh, cattle breed, cementals are not tropical breeds, and they, and ticks are just one of the many problems they're facing, as you just uh, notice. If we look at that same animal uh, 10 days after one of those uh, uh, heavy infestations, uh, you can see all the lesions that uh, are present on that uh, skin. Uh, there is a lo obvious loss of hair, uh, many crust uh, scabs uh, throughout the brisket, the rear uh, flank, the shoulders, everywhere. And if you notice, uh, there are some bleeding areas. Those uh, were uh, injuries that were basically inflicted by, by the animal just uh, rubbing and scratching himself against every uh, tree and, and uh, fence post on that uh, enclosure. Now the other problem that the wounds uh, created by ticks uh, create is that uh, they become ideal ground for uh, uh, fly larvae like the screw worm. This type of uh, uh, fly larvae is renowned for eating living tissue in just about any worm uh, blooded animal. Uh, in fact, the scientific name it receives is uh, Cochleomyia uh, ominivorax. Uh, and I'm sure I'm not saying that correctly, but it literally translates as a man-eating uh, blowfly. Now, finally, when talking about the biology of ticks, uh, I also need to mention the need for uh, suitable plants that will favor the attachment uh, onto the host. In our cases, some of the plants that are used as uh, forage for cattle are the ones you see here. These are favorite plants by farmers. Uh, we have the African star grass and numerous uh, species of uh, signal grass. Unfortunately, these uh, two species make it really easy for those uh, tick larvae to climb up to the top of those uh, grass leaves. Uh, on the video that will address the integrated management program, we will uh, mention some of the uh, alternative uh, forages that, that either have uh, repellent uh, substances or uh, simply retard or make it difficult for those uh, tick larvae uh, to climb to the top of the plant. The third life cycles that I would like to address are some of the fly species that, that impact uh, uh, cattle on pasture in the tropics uh, and a basic knowledge of their life cycle which uh, can be very different between different species is uh, becomes necessary if we really want to implement uh, some, some good management uh, options. 
On the top image we have a picture of the horn fly uh, on the withers of a cow. This is a blood feeding uh, fly that stays on the animal all the time, except when it, uh, the female uh, leaves to uh, deposit eggs on uh, fresh cow manure. Uh, this uh, aspect of uh, its biology becomes very important uh, compared with other species of flies because if we could uh, remove those uh, flies uh, mechanically from the back of those animals we could uh, substantially reduce the infestation at the farm level without uh, the need to use uh, insecticides or uh, other type of uh, antiparasitic drugs. So if we look at the cycle on the top right uh, we should probably include that uh, the adults uh, live permanently on top of the animal. Uh, the eggs are deposited on fresh cow manure on the, pa on the pasture and uh, to complete its cycle it may take anywhere between 10 to 20 days uh, under uh, warm ideal conditions. Uh, it's usually considered an economic injury level the smallest uh, number of flies that will uh, cause harm equal to the cost of a control measure. For horn flies it has been estimated to be about 200 flies uh, per animal and beyond that number uh, management actions should be taken uh, to prevent losses uh, due to say uh, reduced milk production or reduced uh, weight gains uh, basically from unwillingness of those animals to uh, continue grazing. Uh, f from all the uh, annoyance and stress of uh, those flies. I mentioned that the breeding habitat uh, for the horn fly is uh, fresh cow manure. If we were to talk about other uh, species of flies like the face fly or the stable fly, uh, we would have to concentrate our efforts on other uh, areas uh, where there is a lot of uh, spoil or uh, decaying uh, vegetations. Uh, and I'm thinking of those uh, large bale feeding sites. Uh, these are uh, perfect uh, breeding grounds for those uh, females to lay their eggs, which is uh, very different from the horn flies. Now, the second parasitic fly that I would like to mention uh, is the tropical whirlwind fly, uh, which is uh, really a form of myiasis. If you notice uh, the nodules or uh, lumps on the legs and shoulders of, the, of that cow. Those were caused by the developing maggot of this uh, fly. Uh, there is, uh, this is definitely one of the most uh, important parasites uh, of cattle in Colombia and it also affects many other hosts. In fact I've seen it in uh, sheep and uh, dogs in uh, rural areas around here and it's really not feasible to target the adult stages uh, because uh, they're free living flies that don't really feed on anything and they have a very short uh, lifespan of only a few days, uh, maybe a week, just enough to uh, pass their eggs onto uh, uh, other insects as you can see on that diagram and then these, uh, and then these other insects uh, act as uh, vectors of those eggs uh, to be uh, deposited on just about any uh, warm blooded host. They painted a cow here, but as I mentioned, that could be uh, any other uh, warm-blooded uh, animal, uh, sheep, uh, dog, uh, even humans. Once the eggs are on the skin, they hatch fairly quickly, and the larvae starts uh, uh, burrow burrowing its uh, way uh, uh, into the skin, down to the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, the larvae will then start uh, growing inside for about five to uh, seven weeks, and it will eventually drop to the ground uh, to be converted into a pupae and then into an adult. And altogether uh, that uh, cycle may be completed in uh, 90 to 110 days. As you can imagine the economic uh, damage uh, can be quite substantial uh, starting by the rejection or simply downgrading of that uh, cow hide and obviously if this is a dairy cow it's going to have a very significant impact uh, on milk production. If it is a beef cow it will reduce uh, weight gains and it's, and it's also good to keep in mind that uh, the size of those uh, nodules uh, to a large extent are uh, due to the host uh, reaction that is trying to uh, surround that uh, maggot in a capsule and even if uh, it, that must be really annoying and stressing uh, for the animal they don't usually become infected unless those uh, maggots are uh, somehow injured inside. And I say this because if you want to uh, remove those uh, maggots uh, manually, you definitely want to make sure that you don't 
crush them or or injure them because that will that could definitely lead into a severe uh, infection in the animal. Another important parasite that we have in our uh, area is the liver fluke, uh, Fasciola hepatica, uh, which has uh, an indirect uh, life cycle. It requires a snail, as you can see on that diagram, uh, to work as an intermediate host. And if if uh, if you look at the table below, that was a, a survey that was conducted in 2013 in 1,000 dairy cows in the high tropics of uh, Antioquia. Uh, just uh, on the top hills of where we live and uh, basically uh, fecal samples were collected from every individual animal and different techniques uh, used to identify uh, each one of those uh, internal uh, parasites that you can see on this table and if you notice uh, the first one, uh, Fasciola, uh, which is the liver fluke uh, was uh, present in almost 30% uh, of those uh, cows now, if we were to focus uh, our efforts uh, on any particular parasites uh, of all the internal ones that we see on this table, uh, this one would definitely be at the top of the list in terms of uh, production losses. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any uh, data to assess uh, the negative impact this is having on milk production or uh, reproduction, but uh, considering the high prevalence of 30%, uh, and that uh, this is a parasite that damages the liver uh, which is the main body organ that processes all the nutrients uh, in the animal it's uh, obvious that uh, the losses uh, that is uh, creating are, are quite uh, substantial if you look at the photograph on the upper uh, uh, left uh, you can see all the severe inflammation that uh, the adult uh, worms are creating on the uh, bile ducts of, uh, of an infected uh, liver now another cycle for a parasite that uh, we have found high prevalence in our cattle is uh, the protozoan uh, Neospora caninum uh, and this is an interesting one because uh, the points, uh, point source of exposure uh, to this uh, organism uh, are the dog feces uh, and this is uh, definitely one reason why you may want to uh, prevent contamination of your uh, livestock uh, uh, feed including those uh, bales of hay that many times are just laying around the farm. For whatever reason, some farm dogs uh, tend to find these uh, places irresistible and they will, uh, given the opportunity, they will just go there and they will add their uh, supplement. Uh, with, this, uh, with this parasite, abortion is really the only uh, clinical problem uh, that it creates in cattle and even though there are many uh, predisposing factors that have been uh, proposed and you can see in the literature most of the time it's not really known what uh, triggers uh, an abortion uh, there are two different uh, forms of uh, transmission uh, there is what's called a horizontal transmission uh, basically this is a cow being infected from uh, eating contaminated feed as I just uh, explained and there is what's called a vertical transmission in which uh, basically baby calves uh, are born uh, apparently normal, they have no clinical signs whatsoever, but they have become infected in utero and they can pass on that uh, infection onto their next uh, progeny. Uh, now, regardless of whether the mode of transmission is uh, vertical or uh, horizontal, we need to keep in mind that any positive cow has a much greater uh, risk of abortion. Uh, I believe it's uh, five to six times higher uh, than a negative one that is uh, obviously not infected. If you look at the table uh, below, that was uh, the survey that uh, we did in 2013 and it shows a really overall high prevalence of 37% uh, of all the animals and uh, it's interestingly, interestingly it's uh, higher on the adults than it is on the young animals. This basically indicates that uh, apart from uh, vertical transmissions uh, of the animals being uh, infected in utero uh, during their pregnancy, they're also being uh, uh, contaminated horizontally. The next idea that I would like to convey plays an essential part on any strategic uh, control management for parasites uh, and it's, uh, it deals with the distribution of parasites uh, within a group or population of animals. Uh, if we look at the level of uh, parasite infection in uh, any group of animals, uh, we'll find that uh, it varies a lot from one animal to another. Uh, you may find that uh, this uh, 
in many uh, websites. Uh, I included some of them here, whose link is uh, down below. Uh, the Maryland Extension Small Ruminant uh, Program. If you look, uh, if you look there, uh, they use uh, a nematode infection as an example, and they measure the level of infection in terms of uh, fecal egg counts. And uh, they found that about 20% of the animals in a flock of sheep uh, will be shedding 80% of the eggs. And they call this the 80-20 uh, rule. Uh, and, and really, without having any uh, data to support uh, this and from just uh, personal observations, I would probably hold my feet to the fire that this, uh, we can extend this uh, to just about any other uh, parasitic species, uh, including uh, cattle tick, uh, horn flies, uh, warble flies, just to name a few of the common uh, ectoparasites uh, that we see here in, uh, in our uh, parts of the, the woods. Now this obviously uh, opens a new doorway uh, to apply uh, target selective treatments instead of just doing uh, blanket treatments uh, which has been the conventional or uh, traditional approach uh, and really continues being done in, in most farms. Uh, in addition it presents a great opportunity uh, to select uh, breeding animals uh, based on uh, parasite resistance uh, and this would obviously over time improve the uh, parasite problem in any farm and as we will see on the next uh, slide uh, parasite resistance is a trait that is uh, greatly inherited uh, from parents uh, to offspring so this is something definitely to keep in mind uh, when doing uh, breeding selection uh, programs now the last uh, topic that I would like to address on this uh, presentation uh, to set the stage for talking about uh, management options uh, deals with this uh, issue of uh, susceptibility of the host uh, towards the parasite, which is obviously uh, intimately uh, linked to the immunity. Immunity is something wh that we tend to disregard completely, and we should really rely on this uh, fantastic defense system to fight infections uh, in instead of using drugs all the time that uh, to try to cover uh, for everything. And uh, before talking about the types of immunity, uh, there is a basic concept that is illustrated on this uh, slide and that could be really applied to any, uh, not only to parasites, but to any other uh, potential uh, pathogens. On the right, there is a graph that uh, compares the degree of immunity of an organism against uh, the exposure uh, challenge uh, to any particular uh, pathogen. Uh, as long as you can see, as long as the line of our defenses is always uh, greater or above uh, the exposure level uh, we can repel an infection and uh, basically win the battle to uh, prevent sickness that's the whole point of that of that graph uh, if we sh look at the graph on the left it shows the same concept uh, for one of the main diseases uh, in neonate calves uh, which is uh, scours a scours probably accounts for the main losses in this uh, age group uh, the yellow line represents the immunity of the calf. As you can see, it starts uh, pretty high when he's ingesting uh, colostrum, but being a passive uh, form of immunity, it wanes uh, fairly quickly, at least for uh, scouring for most uh, scouring pathogens uh, like uh, rotavirus or coronavirus or cryptosporidium, uh, among others. And as you can see, uh, uh, after the second week of life, uh, that calf uh, will start. Uh, mounting its own active immunity uh, against these uh, potential pathogens and if we notice there is what's called a window where that animal would be uh, most uh, vulnerable and that had takes place around the second and the third week of life uh, so if the degree of exposure to any one uh, scouring pathogen is, uh, is exceeds the defenses line uh, then the animal will definitely develop a scours and if you notice, uh, the red columns uh, basically shows the percent of cases that uh, happen uh, at different ages uh, in this uh, first month of life. And as you can notice, uh, the, they tend to congregate around the second and the third week of life when those uh, defenses are, are lower. Now, looking at this uh, graph, we could reason that the problem uh, of scours could be uh, prevented by simply reducing the exposure level uh, to the point that the yellow line is always above the green one. I'm not going to go into details uh, of ways of doing this. 
I will just uh, mention that the main source of exposure uh, to uh, scouring pathogens uh, will be where there is a lot of uh, fecal contamination. Uh, this, this tends to happen in uh, crowded uh, conditions uh, if those babies are all co-mingled together uh, or if they happen to uh, coexist with uh, uh, older calves. Older calves tend to have uh, better defenses but they will still be eliminating uh, quite large quantities of uh, scouring pathogens uh, compared with adult uh, individuals. Uh, this has been called the multiplying effect of uh, young individuals uh, compared with adults and that's one reason why you want to separate by age uh, at least in this uh, first part of life. Now there are two different classes of immunity. Uh, there is what's called uh, innate immunity. Uh, it's also called uh, inborn or uh, naturally inherited. On the slide we have a picture of the San Croix lamps uh, which are the most uh, resistant breed to internal uh, nematode uh, parasites. They, they basically have a natural uh, genetic makeup uh, which makes them uh, very resistant. There is also a significant uh, within and between uh, breed var variation in what's called uh, resistance uh, and, resist and resilience. Uh, the first one, uh, resistance, is really the ability to prevent infection from establishing. As you can see, it can be quantified by doing fecal leg counts uh, and it's a trait which has a uh, quite uh, moderate uh, inheritance. Now if the animal has uh, great resilience uh, it means that the parasite will get established but the animal will will have the ability to limit the damage uh, done by the parasite. Obviously this is quantified differently. Uh, you have to do some clinical ass assessment of that animal. Uh, for example doing a, a pack cell volume which is uh, an indicator of uh, damage uh, by the barbara pole worm, uh, which is a blood feeding uh, parasite. As you can see, this is a trait that is also inherited, but to a much uh, lesser extent than the resistant trait, uh, which is really the one we should seek to uh, select for. If we talk about acquired immunity, this is obviously not inherited, uh, it's acquired throughout the life of the animal. Uh, this type of immunity obviously increases as the animal gets older and the age at which uh, it develops uh, greater resistance is uh, going to depend on the exposure level to any particular pathogen and obviously on the breed and the type of parasite. Next I'm going to show you a perfect example of this uh, type of immunity but just keep in mind that uh, immunity can always be overcome by stresses like uh, undernourishment, uh, parturition, nursing, and as I mentioned on the previous slide, any overwhelming uh, infection or challenge to uh, any particular uh, pathogen. Uh, here I'm just going to uh, address uh, the effect of uh, age, physiological state and nutrition on uh, acquired immunity. This slide shows the results of a cross-sectional uh, study that was conducted in, in uh, 1,000 dairy cows uh, from 29 farms uh, here in the highland tropics of uh, Colombia. Uh, fecal leg -like counts uh, were uh, done on each one of those animals and what you can see on this uh, table uh, is the parasite burden for strongyle and coccidia on the left column. And there are two groups of animals that were divided in those uh, younger than a year old and those that were more than one year of age. Uh, if, if we look at the prevalence of uh, strongyles uh, you'll see that 70% uh, uh, of the animals uh, that were more than one year old uh, were negative as opposed to only 55% uh, in the younger uh, one year old group. The, also if there were any adults that were positive we see that the, the infections were really light uh, whereas if we look at the young group uh, some of the animals had counts that were even uh, higher than 7x uh, uh, per gram. Now if we look at the coccidia numbers, uh, the same tendency was observed. Uh, it's very rare to see adult uh, individuals uh, shedding oocyst, which is the name that uh, coccidia egg uh, receives. And if they do, their counts are, tend to be usually very low. So again, this uh, epidemiological study provides evidence that uh, acquired immunity increases as the animal gets older, at least for these two uh, types of uh, parasites. I'm going to cite another example of acquired immunity. Uh, this is the longworm disease of cattle, uh, Dictyocolus uh, viviparus. Uh, 
uh, this case, uh, the case on this video and these uh, images uh, were from a, a case that was re referred to us uh, by a producer that lost uh, seven calves of about uh, six to uh, eight months of age in just a matter of a few weeks. Uh, the most striking observation at the necropsy was that the trachea and the bronchi uh, were filled with uh, blood clots, as you can see on that video, and those uh, blood clots are surrounded by uh, tangles of uh, mature forms of uh, the lungworm. Uh, this parasite has a direct life cycle, like most other uh, uh, important nematodes uh, in ruminants, and the one difference that I would uh, uh, quote um, is that uh, female worms uh, deposit eggs in the bronchi, uh, which are coughed up and swallowed, and by the time they're expelled with the feces, they have already hatched. So really, from a diagnostic standpoint, uh, in a live animal, we should really look for the larvae uh, in fresh, uh, voided uh, feces. Uh, now, the other thing maybe I should mention is that their life cycle uh, includes a migration from the small intestine, uh, which is done through the lymphatic vessels of the guts uh, initially, and then it goes uh, through the heart onto the pulmonary arteries, and then from here into the airways. Now, I'll have to say that uh, we probably have uh, many unreported cases of this uh, parasitic uh, bronchitis, uh, because uh, most uh, veterinarians and uh, farmers uh, will simply treat as if it's a viral or a lung uh, bacterial infection um, and without even they don't even think that this is a major differential uh, respiratory disease uh, in calves at least in our uh, intensive uh, grazing systems if if you look at the study on the table below that was a survey that was uh, conducted at a slaughterhouse in Canada they examined uh, 10,000 lungs uh, for the presence of uh, lungworms and the animals were classified as young if they were less than a year old and uh, adults if they were more than one year of age and uh, if you notice the infection rate was 4.25 uh, percent in the young individuals uh, as opposed to 1.23 in the adult groups so again this shows the importance of uh, age in, in developing uh, acquired immunity now if we move on into the another aspect of immunity uh, I'll have to say that even if the adults are usually more uh, resistant than the neonates or the younger animals, at the time of parturition that immunity is relaxed uh, somehow and uh, if we uh, look at uh, strongyl worms, uh, for example, uh, we'll see that there is what's called a periparturient uh, egg rise. Uh, this uh, phenomenon is uh, very well reported in uh, sheep and goats uh, and even though the, the cause is not uh, exactly known, uh, it makes sense that uh, resources uh, necessary for uh, uh, a solid immunity are being diverted to uh, the, the, the effort of uh, reproduction. Now, it's also uh, possible that the spring rise in egg counts that uh, happens in uh, temperate uh, climates uh, due, due to those uh, hibernating uh, larvae. These uh, larvae are now waking up, uh, maturing, uh, developing into adults and starting to shed eggs. So it's possible that those uh, two occurrences are taking place uh, together in countries uh, with uh, distinct uh, climate seasons. In the next uh, video uh, I will present a case which uh, I have a short video clip here on this uh, slide. This was uh, referred to us by a sheep producer. Uh, he had severe uh, death losses of lambs and use around the time of lambing and we found out that the cause of death was uh, the varval pole worm that had become resistant uh, to every uh, dewormer that we have available in the country. However, in this case, uh, poor nutrition was uh, probably uh, the main reason why a subclinical situation became clinical. In this case, and uh, after doing uh, many uh, body condition scores on that flock, uh, we were uh, pretty confident that uh, inadequate nutrition was really uh, tipping the balance uh, in favor of the uh, parasites. Uh, the ewes basically on their final uh, trimester of uh, uh, pregnancy were not being provided with any additional feed apart from what they could uh, harvest uh, on their own. And uh, if you look at the image on that ewe on the right, uh, it was a typical case. Uh, she had lost uh, both of its lambs 
and as you can see her body condition is uh, severely emaciated uh, we did uh, some uh, blood work uh, we found out that she was very anemic with a pack cell volume of only eight eight percent and a very high fecal egg, egg counts of almost all uh, barber pole worm eggs and unfortunately she died the day after that picture uh, was was taken I think this is uh, my final slide and I wanted to say something about nutrition uh, there are different components to nutrition uh, so I will just mention one which is uh, energy uh, that is expressed here as uh, in terms of uh, to uh, TDN uh, that stands for uh, total digestible nutrients uh, and I want to show this graph so you can uh, you can obs observe how the energy requirements on an animal uh, in this case a doe vary a lot depending on the physiological state uh, of that female as you can see uh, at day zero of pregnancy and during the first uh, 50 days of uh, the nutrient requirements are the same as uh, maintenance level uh, they can probably do okay on whatever forage is provided by them but as you can see the demands uh, increase in the second and the third uh, trimester uh, and he may not and she may not be able to eat enough uh, forage uh, to meet those uh, requirements so at that point supplementation becomes uh, crucial uh, to pe to keep her uh, condition score and uh, we found that uh, uh, most of those animals uh, had uh, uh, scores of uh, two and many with uh, one and ideally we want condition scores of uh, three and four uh, and at the moment, as I say, about two-thirds of that flock uh, were with conditions of uh, two and one. On the next video, we will uh, revise the serious problem of resistance uh, to antiparasitic drugs that we have in our part of the country. And I will dedicate a separate video to propose uh, some options and ideas uh, that we really need to start uh, implementing if we want to be successful on treating uh, problems uh, by parasites. So thank you very much for listening, and if you enjoyed this uh, presentation, I welcome you to uh, watch uh, future ones. Bye-bye.